Today I'm going to talk about intracranial atherosclerotic disease and uh, this lecture will kind of cover everything that you would or you should know about ICAD and also you can learn at the end as to how you could plan a procedure and uh, we also hope that you will understand the indication, the contraindications and also an idea about what the current standards of treatment are and the review of current literature. So to start with, let's talk about atherosclerosis. Now atherosclerosis, as you know, is a degenerative disease of the blood vessels and it begins within the arteries with the retention of low density lipoprotein within the inner arterial wall which induces inflammation causing endothelial dysfunction. Now once this endothelial dysfunction sets in because of the lipoprotein inside smooth muscles tend to proliferate and uh, along with that macrophages also collect under the endothelium and the endothelium gets damaged and forms a plaque which is very very susceptible to rupture. Now if you take a look at this diagram this is how a healthy vessel should look you got the endothelium out here the smooth muscles form the media the adventitia forms the outer layer and in an intracranial vessel in addition, you will have an inter internal elastic lamina without the external elastic lamina. Now what happens is this, now this gets laden with fat, the endothelium is damaged, smooth muscles have come migrated into this area, macrophages are transformed into foam cells and it develops, the smooth muscles out here develops a fibrous cap and on top of that, degeneration induces the deposition of lipids, calcium and cellular debris. So this is what happens in real life. You will have this artery, a plaque starts forming here. The plaque enlarges at any time. This thin fibrous cap may give way because of inflammation and this in turn will induce thrombosis and occlusion of the vessel secondary to activation of the interest, intrinsic pathway. Now this is the lumen of the vessel, this is how it would look in the acute phase and this is how a plaque would look when it's stabilized. And this is a stable plaque, the basic difference being that the fibrous cap out here is a lot more stable and this plaque is very very prone to rupture and this is not. So how does this unstable plaque become a stable plaque? It can be induced by lowering the LDL, by lowering the angiotensin through, through drugs like AC inhibitors, induce ensuring that the diabetes is well controlled, reducing oxidative stress, reducing blood pressure and all these will stabilize the arthroma. And at this point of time, it is safe to do any intervention because the chances of acute reocclusion and distal emboli is extremely low. Now before we go forward, we will understand a key dif a difference between the intracranial vessels and the extracranial vessels. Even if you forget everything, just remember the intracranial vessels are much thinner than the extracranial vessels. In other words, the, the muscle layer or the media is much much smaller, it does not have an external elastic lamina and also the elastic fibers that are there in the media are vastly reduced in this area and there is no vasovacerum because the vessel is thin and it gets its oxygenation directly from the blood that is flowing. Now what does it mean? It basically means remember these vessels are more prone to rupture, thus when we plan for a dilatation of the balloon we have to undersize the balloon lest we end up with a disaster. So what's the pathophysiology? Cerebral atherosclerotic disease leads to the loss of compliance and elasticity of the arteries which in turn leads to the arterial lumen narrowing which leads to progressive ischemia which leads to embolic events primarily because of turbulence 
that takes place there and also because of the plaque that is exposed the plaque in turn can rupture which would induce in an embolic event or an in situ thrombosis and the patient can present with stroke with any one of these so what are the incidences of ICAD, especially in a country like India? We do not have the statistics, but we know in the United States of America, stroke is the fifth most common cause, and thus ICAD represents only 8 to 10 percent of the patients who come with stroke. Whereas in China, where it is the most common cause of stroke, ICAD will represent something as 20 to 46 percent of the patients. So in a country like India, probably it's somewhere in between, even in our own practice, we notice that uh, maybe 20 or 30 percent of the patients do have ICAD, and that's why our mind should be always open towards it. So, if we have a patient who comes with a stroke or with a narrowing of vessel, it does not mean that everyone has got ICAD just because the vessel is narrow. And the key differential diagnosis is: is it vasculitis? Is it cerebral dissection? Or is it a moya moya disease, which again comes under the vasculitis? Now, if it is vasculitis, it tends to involve multiple intracranial vessels, and uh, if it and if you investigate, you will get uh, uh, markers to suggest like the CRP will be elevated. You will see an ESR elevated. You will uh, and uh, as you investigate further, you may get specific uh, uh, test anti-nuclear antibodies or any of these could be positive, which will point towards vasculitis. Whereas in cerebral dissection, the key thing is the angiographic finding. So what is the kind of angiographic finding you expect? You see a narrowing of the vessel followed by a dilatation at times or sometimes you can see actually in cross section the dissected flap itself. And uh, also these are more associated with some underlying disease. For example, if a patient has got collagen vascular disease or fibromuscular dysplasia, this patient again is more prone for dissection. Sometimes you may get a history of trauma which also could be the reason why there is dissection. Moya Moya disease on the other hand is a progressive disease which starts with narrowing of the supraclinoid vessels then it goes into the proximal vessels and then later we see in you know, exuberant collaterals developing from the external carotid artery coming through the perforators and uh, supplying the brain. Uh, so when you see some of these findings you realize this patient is not a patient with eye care uh, and the biggest problem is many of these diseases may mimic eye care appearance, especially in when it's early. Thus, you know, there is a role for advanced imaging. When we talk about advanced imaging, the key imaging that is changing the way we analyze vessels is 7 Tesla MRI, where we can actually study the vessel wall. And the other one is OCT, uh, which is optical coherence tomography, which actually involves coherent light, uh, which is... Uh, beamed out in 360 degrees and then it reconstructs the whole vessel and it produces exquisite detail of the vessels. For example, here is a picture of an OCT of an atherosclerotic vessel where the intima alone shows increased thickening. You can see beautiful delineation of the media and the adventitia which is outside. So you can see the detailing that you see. Now look at this. This is a patient with a dissection. Very easy to say this patient has got a false lumen out here. Even in the longitudinal axis, you can see the false lumen. Thus, you have no doubt about the diagnosis. That is not even a differential diagnosis in these cases. Or look at this atherosclerotic area. You can see this ulcerated, irregular plaque out here. Even looking at it, you know this patient should be stabilized with statins at least for a couple of weeks before you take them up because you know these are the ones that are most prone to have complication, the distal emboli, during an interventional procedure. So if you study uh, the blood vessels of the brain with high resolution MRI, we can see plaques, we can see inflammatory activity in the form of contrast enhancement. We can also see anatomical relationship of the perforators, which is also very important as you will see later during the talk. Now on your right side is a patient with vasculitis on the left after treatment. If you look over here, what exactly are you seeing out here? Here you see it's a plain scan, so it looks pretty normal. Once you give contrast, the, the vessel walls are enhancing. The MR angiogram shows narrowing out here. And look out here, enhancement has completely disappeared and the vessel has opened up. So you can understand how easy it is to study vasculitis if you have the right now. 
here is another one where we are actually demonstrating atherosclerotic plaque can you see this one here the eccentric plaque out here beautifully delineated in uh, uh, in the MR and this also shows enhancement with contrast which shows that the plaque is still not stabilized and still there is active inflammation going out there. You can also see smaller vessels like the MCA. Look at this. We are taking a SAG can check, uh, 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 cuts which is actually taken exactly in axial view of the MCA. You can see the narrowing out here and the branches coming out. So with image we get a lot of information which we couldn't get initially. Also, like I said, we can have very, very good detailing of the perforators. Also, right up to the vertebral artery. Why is it important? If you have a stenosis across the perforator and you dilate it, there is no plowing, the plaque is pushed into the perforators and you can have a major stroke. So it makes us understand the patients which are suitable for an intervention and which are not. So let's come to the treatment. The thing about treatment of eye care is we have to understand it's still work in progress. We still have not got the absolute answers for everything, but still over the last few years, especially in the last decade, we have had a much, much better level of understanding. So let's start with medical management. The initial medical management was based on this trial, uh, trial called the WASI trial. Basically, warfarin versus aspirin for symptomatic intracranial disease. Now, what did it show? They said that if you give a patient, keep a patient on warfarin on a lower dose, keeping the INR to just about 2 and adding 75 milligrams of aspirin, the chance of ischemic stroke was 14% in a patient who came with a TIA with an associated 70% stenosis. On the other hand, if the imaging showed features of infarct, and the patient had the same stenosis, the chances of stroke or death in one year was 23%. So for some time, this was the main therapy. After that came the Sampras trial in which they compared stenting along with aggressive medical management. So what was aggressive medical management? For the first three months, the patient got clopidogrel and aspirin, then aspirin only. Then they gave statins to ensure that the LDL levels were down to 70 milligrams. The pressure was controlled that the systolic was not over 140. Blood glucose and hemoglobin was kept under tight control. The it was, patients were strongly, strongly uh, advised to stop smoking. And those who did not stop smoking wouldn't come into the trial. And the patients were encouraged to lose their weight. <clears throat> so it definitely showed that medical therapy had a reasonably good result. At 30 days, the re-bleed or the death rate was just 5.5% compared to the stenting room, which was about 12%, and the one-year stroke and death rate was 12.2%. So with this study, it kind of brought to an end the concept that stenting could be used as first-line therapy because the the medical management had definitely shown that at least in the first month that medical management had much lower complication and thus it was a safer option okay so what about surgical therapy surgical therapy again did not have much to offer the earliest surgical therapy for icad was uh, pioneered by sundetol who performed open surgical endarterotomy of the cerebral arteries but the problem was the where cerebral arteries are very small vessel, just two to four millimeter. And at two to four millimeter, the surgery was technically very, very challenging. So they tried bypasses where they would either take the superficial temporal artery or take a radial artery graft or the saphenous uh, uh, vein was used as a graft. And they were prospective trials done on it, but they were also not very, very promising. And we have a very good trial, which is called the COST trial or the carotid occlusion surgery trial, which compared surgical bypass with medical therapy and had, you know, they had a mean uh, a recruitment time of 75 days from the time of TIA. Let us see what was this result. But you can see out here, zero to 90 days to all the way down to two and a half years. The blue line is the result of medical therapy. And this was, the red was the 
uh, the patients with uh, the bypass, you can see all across the cumulative proportion of patients with event was much, much higher. In the initial three months, it was extremely high. And later on, it would only plateau up somewhere after two years. So it's pretty obvious that this also was not a great option for the management of stroke or patients with TIA. Technically, you can see over here, ipsilateral ischemic stroke was 14.4% uh, uh, in the uh, surgical group and 2% in the non-surgical group. Obviously, we could not accept this also as a form of treatment. So let's come to endovascular treatment in great detail. Also to understand, is the SAMPRAS trial really the cornerstone that we should still hold on to or has things changed over the last decade or so? Let's start with balloon angioplasty. Initially, when people tried balloon angioplasty, the results were not very exciting. And the, pay, the vessel used to occlude, there was dissection, there's acute elastic recoil, and so we generally felt that this was not the best way to go ahead and do the treatment. The big problem here was this, the cerebral vessels, as we told right in the beginning, are smaller size vessels. They do not have any elastic lamina, the media is much thinner. So one of the problems was at that point of time, people were using optimal dilatation, which itself was leading to problems. Thus came the concept of sub maximal angioplasty or actually not going to the actual diameter of the vessel but rather than come in dropping it by say about 0.25 or a 0.5 millimeter difference now there were no, now connors at all they had a publication in 1991 which showed that submaximal balloon angioplasty with so inflammation uh, inflation was developed and it recommended as a better option for intracranial stenosis. So they had 41 consecutive patients, high-grade stenosis, more than 70%, all of them were atherosclerotic. They did just sub-interval, sub-maximal, sorry, angioplasty alone and the 30-day event rate and the one-year perioperative ischemic event-free survival rate was 4.9 and 91 respectfully. And this, as we can know, was better than the Sampras trial. Like I said, so this is something that was a change in the way that we were looking at. And we realized that, uh, 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 that this probably was something that we should think. And this was a publication in 1999. Then came the drug eluting bleeds. We still have to see the future about it. We still don't have the answer, but the initial studies were not very rewarding. So now let's have a look at endovascular therapy with intracranial stenting as where it stands. The early treatment with ICAD with stenting was the use of coronary balloons. And we'll talk even today they have a position. And the original study, which was called the Sylvia Clinical Trial, was done with a dedicated stent. But unfortunately, the, the company stopped manufacturing stent altogether. But we must understand balloon expandable stents have got some very, very definite advantages. So what are the advantages? One, they're precise. Good, they got excellent radial force. Three, today's modern drug eluting stents are good because they prevent restenosis. And it can be done by a single operator. Technically, it's far less challenging. What are the disadvantages? It's difficult to cross a tight siphon or rather impossible to cross a bad or a, uh, a, a tortuous elongated siphon. Like I said, it induces snow plowing, so if there are perforators, the vessel will go. And there is typically no dedicated stent that has been created for the brain. But on the other hand, stenting in the vertebrobasilar segment, especially below the ICA, was a lot more promising. Stenting in 97 patients with symptomatic intracranial vertebrobasilar stenosis showed that balloon mounted stents have a lower rate of restoral stenosis and are more suitable for a patient with a smooth concentric stenosis. And this again was, uh, uh, it's, a, it's a very, very uh, good study, though it was done in 2004. We still use it in our center in many, many situations, as I will show you in the cases. Then came the wingspan. Now the wingspan is the only FDA approved intracerebral stent. The wingspan is the first self-expanding stent. The problem with it is that it is over the wire. 
it's not a rapid exchange system so you need an exchange wire system and like i said it went into a lot of distribute because of the sampris trial now there were two subsequent registries each enrolling over 150 patients with the delivery of wingspan stents and the US Windspan Registry and the NIH Windspan Registry were what it was called. Both of them demonstrated 6% periprocedural complication rate, which is much lower than the, uh, the 12 to 14% that was seen in the Sampris trial. So, what was the problem with the Sampris trial? The Sampris trial was good because it was prospective, it was randomized, so it's scientifically it was appropriate. It compared wing stand, stents with aggressive medical management alone. The use of the stent was allowed because uh, FDA allowed it as an uh, uh, exemptive device. And the problem was the study uh, demonstrated a very high periprocedural complication rate of close to 15%. Now that was way too high to be used and this was in the first one month of its use. But let's look at the WEAVE trial, another trial that came through uh, more recently. This trial, as you know, was designed to determine the safety of the stent when used strictly on label. That means the stenosis had to be above 70%. The patient was typically not responding to medical management. And they had 152 on label patient, which was the largest on label trial performed in the US. The periprocedural complication was 2.6% compared to the 14.6% in the first month, which was really, really low. The trial inclusion protocol and the patient management protocol were strict, and the clinical uh, outcomes were adjusted by core neurologists. So why did Sampras fail? One of the primary differences was that in the Sampras trial, the stinting was performed within seven days of the stroke. Whereas in this, it was two to three weeks after the stroke, where the patient was a dual antiplatelet, the patient was in status, and the plaque had stabilized. So let's us understand that that is a key factor that one has to keep in mind when one is treating eye care. So the, in Sampras, they did it just for seven days. When uh, you and uh, Jing of the Sampras trial, uh, they actually analyzed the sample style field further and what did they find? 30 days following stenting or initiation of medical therapy alone, there was a three-fold higher rate of disabling fatal stroke in the medical, medical therapy group when compared to stenting group. And uh, uh, with a 6.2% uh, event rate in the medical group and 22 in the stenting group. This implies that if uh, angioplasty and stenting can be performed with a low periprocedural complication, then the long-term benefit of the stent provides protection. What they are trying to say is, now if you take the statistics beyond the first month, that means from the second month to the twelfth month, and you compare medical with stenting, you realize that the medical people were actually doing worse. But you take the cumulative, there was a problem. So in other words, what this group was saying is, if you can keep the periprocedural complication low, then this, op this modality of treatment definitely would be a offer definite advantages over medical management. Now also the problem was Sampras never looked at the cause or the mechanism of ischemic stroke. The mechanism of ischemic stroke basically can be because of three reasons. One, it can be local perforator ischemia, where the stenosis across the perforators, and this is the worst set of groups to be treated by angioplasty. The second is artery to artery embolism, and here the best form is medical management. You have a stenosis, it's throwing distal emboli, and this is artery to artery. You put them on antiplatelet, this trigger factor or the, the fact the platelet addition that takes place on the stenotic segment comes down and the patient will benefit. Then comes the hemodynamic hyperperfusion. Now what is it that we are telling here? In this group of patients, the stenosis is significant. There is low pressure zone beyond the stenosis. 
and this group of patients again will do very well with angioplasty. Now, when Sampras did, they didn't bother what was the underlying cause. They took patients with lesions across the stenosis and thus these patients were destined to do badly. So, exclusion of symptomatic patients with perforator infarction before PTA and stenting in the Sampras trial could have decreased the rate from 30 days ischemic stroke to 14 point, I mean the 30 day stroke from 14.7 to 9.4. You got it? So just by excluding this, forgetting everything else, we'll tell you these operators are not even experienced operators. They were doing within seven days, keeping all those factors constant. Just by taking this out alone, you would have brought a significant risk if you had analyzed the end and decided which patients need it. So this is the picture. For example, if the patient has got a stenosis across the perforator, this is bad, whether here or in the vertebral artery. If you have a patient who is throwing, dis uh, throwing distal emboli, which is basically artery to artery embolism, this group of patients will do better with medical management. And, st and stenosis may not, may not really worsen the condition, but probably is not necessary at all. Or I mean, angioplasty may not worsen the condition, but is probably not necessary at all. And this, on the other hand, where there is hypoperfusion beyond the stenosis, now that is the group of patients that actually benefit. What were the other issues of Sampras? The subsequent analysis, including criticism of the inexperience of the investigators, the early treatment with stenting of patients with stroke, and the potential inadequate antiplatelet therapy and the inclusion of off-label patients were all, all problems with the Sampras trial. Following Sampras, there have been several trials and all of them have shown better benefit by just ensuring that the treatment was done two to three weeks later. Now have a look at this. Now if you look at these trials, HT, US Registry, NIH, Sampras, uh, uh, Mia, Zhao, Gao, Ma, Weave. Now, we have a whole lot of these studies out here, and the peri procedure complication falls 4, 4.5, 6.9, uh, 6.25, 4.2, way below the 14.7. Why? Because the time of stroke was 19 days, 22 days, 21 days, 21 days, 22 days, 22 days, and here alone 7 days. You do it at 7 days and you have problems. So that clearly shows that postpone the treatment to two to three weeks and the chances of complications are going to be much less. Also one must understand something called the Morris classification basically talks about how difficult is a lesion to stent. The type A is the ideal case that should be stented. It's a short less than 5 mm or a 5 mm lesion. It's concentric and the vessel anatomy is conducive to treatment. Type 2 is tubular, 5 to 10 mm long, that's a 1 cm long lesion, extremely eccentric, moderately angulated or, uh, or chronically occlusive but for less than 3 months. So you got it, a lesion which is 1 cm long, a lesion which has got an occlusion but less than 3 cm or a very eccentric lesion. Whereas type 3 is worse, length of the stenosis more than 10 uh, millimeters, more than a centimeter extremely angulated vessel of 90 degrees with excessive tortuous proximal segment or a chronic occlusion which is more than three months old. Obviously, this is bad. So here we have the clinical success. In a Maurice A, 92%. In a B, it's 86% and a C is 33%. Obviously, because these are chronically occluded. Angiographic restenosis in A, 0 at 1 year, B, 33% and C, 100%. So it shows that in chronic occlusions, we should not even be trying to open it. Even in acute occlusions, which is less than a month, it may not be a good idea. Ipsilateral ischemic stroke in 1 year, 88%, 12%, 56 So we get it, the lesion morphology also can make a big, big difference on the final outcome. Now look at weave trial. 100% of the patients in the VEEF trial were treated on label, symptomatic lesions, more than 70%. They did not enroll patients within 7 days. They did not allow lesions than 14 mm to be treated. That's basically, we are talking about uh, 
the Morris classification when the type C was not included. Also, there was formal training. The each of the doctors who performed had at least done 25 cases before they went ahead and treated, unlike the uh, Sampras trial, where some people had just done two or three cases. Pre-medication was strict. They were on statins and antiplatelets. Best practice guidelines were used. They ensured there was an infusion of a vasodilator going inside. And all the techniques were like a classical neurointervention. And also the systolic pressures were kept less than 140 post-operatively to prevent bleed. So with these, the complication uh, levels dropped enormously. Now, the goal was to be a person to be enrolled to be an operator. The operator should have done at least 25 stents, but the average was actually 37. In contrast to Sampras, what did we have? The experience was 10 on average and some had just done three patients. Obviously, the experience is really, really poor. The impact of experience was so good that people who had put more than 50 stents had zero complication. That shows again that technique matters. You just can't have anybody doing a procedure because obviously complications are going to be more and more. And if you thus compare the modern studies that came from Jiang, Li, Wang, Zhao, Ma, you would find that the total event was just eight. Compared, if you look at the medical management, the total event was 15.4, clearly telling us there is a definite place for medical management, uh, for endovascular management. If you follow the guidelines properly, you ensure that you delay it by a couple of weeks. Currently, there are a few more ongoing trials. One is from China, the CASSISS trial, China angioplasty and stenting for symptomatic intracranial severe stenosis which already is showing a picture of very, very good result. And the YCAT study, the wingspan for intracranial atherosclerotic disease from Japan, and both of them are already showing very, very promising result. Thus, in patients presenting with a stroke, if the periprocedural complication rate can be kept low with experienced interventionalist, if breast practice are used regarding periprocedural patient management, if the patient undergoes delayed stenting, say of 21 days, stenting may be competitive or potentially superior to medical therapy for patient presenting with 70 to 99 percent intracranial stenosis. And I think we must take this home that there is a definite role if we follow the guidelines appropriately. So now that we kind of got this idea that there is a role and in the future we're going to see better and better indications coming, what are the hardware that are available? We got coronary balloons. What's the advantage? They're freely available. They're very cheap. The dedicated neuro balloons, as you see, is a new, is a, it's a far more expensive balloon, and especially in India, where we can get it like ten thousand rupees, where the other one is more than a lakh. Second thing, the disadvantage: it's still off-label for us. We don't have dedicated balloons except one, and coronary balloons are not dedicated technically for the brain, and. Once you have a monorail balloon and you want to put a stent, you have to go for an exchange maneuver, which itself has got its own set of complications. Now, Stryker sells Gateway as a dedicated intracranial balloon. I don't know why. It's just as similar as any other coronary balloon in structure, morphology, and in terms of uh, the pressures required for optimal dilatation. But the balloon that we currently have dedicated is from Acanthus and it's called the Neurospeed. The key advantage, it's called two lumens, one for the wire, one for the balloon. The second advantage is that it's got a usable length of 150 centimeter. The lumen for the wire is 0165. Technically, the greatest advantage is you can take their stem from Acanthus, which is called the Credo, and deploy it through the balloon through the wire lumen of the balloon catheter. So technically, what does it mean? You don't need an exchange manual. You do a dilatation, appropriate, don't do anything, don't even move the balloon, just take the stent, deploy it and come. Obviously, complication rates are going to draw, uh, going to reduce. So thus, except for the cost of the balloon, the price is so much better. So let's talk about the stents. I talked about the Credo stent, the stent that goes in through the Neurospeed balloon. The Credo stent is a nitinol uh, a stent. 
it is laser cut it is closed cell and the best thing about it is that it can be retrieved so if you're not really happy with the position you can retrieve it it comes in a diameter from 3 to 3.5 to 4.5 and a constant length to uh, of 220 mm and so it can go for a vessel in the range of 2 to 4 mm now fluoroscopic this is how it looks it's got the distal markers and the proximal markers and it's got a band in the wire that is in within the uh, stent and you position this band across the stenosis because this is the segment of the stent which is got the highest radial force this is how the picture would look it's technically not very challenging to do it and goes and behaves very very well the wingspan on the other stand is an open cell nitinol platform has got an outer sheet so it doesn't require a micro catheter to load it into so you do an angioplasty need an exchange wire now over the exchange wire you take the wingspan and deploy it so you got radio markers at the tip over here the rest is nitinol so it's flexible because of the open cell design but like i said it goes over an exchange wire and this is how you deploy it typically slowly pulling back the sheet and deploying across the lesion what about coronary stents there are some coronary stents who behave pretty well especially in the posterior circulation like the resolute from Medtronic, which is a balloon which is pretty flexible but like i said even this would not cross the siphon so anything below the siphon anything in the posterior circulation ex below the eye cup because above that the perforators are, are more and you may end up with a brainstem stroke and like i said if you want to take it remember one thing this kind of siphon is a problem this siphon is difficult you know this is the only siphon through which it will go the type 2, the type 3 and the type 4 can be technically very challenging. Definitely a no for the type 3 and the type 4. When you do a balloon angioplasty, remember once again, you have to reduce the size of the balloon. You have to actually do a suboptimal angioplasty, otherwise you can have a problem. So what are the steps? First you do an angio, ideally with a Dyna CT or a cone beam CT, so you can actually take the ideal measurement of the vessels. Measure the normal segment distal if you are using a coronary stent. Measure the normal segment proximal if you are using a self-expanding stent like the Credo. And once you have taken that, take a long sheet like the Neuromax or Infinity to the Pitrus. And uh, it is important, very very important, especially if you are doing a coronary stent. Take a coronary balloon, a CAT5 and a Traxxas EX combination. Now you can replace a coronary balloon with a Neurospeed if you are going to use that. Now this combination is what you take together and you'll track the CAT5 over the balloon catheter, position the CAT5 about 15 millimeter proximal to the stenosis, cross the lesion, then go ahead and dilate. Remember once you dilate, deflate, do not move the balloon, take your angio there. If there is a rupture, inflate the balloon and wait. If you're lucky, this can solve the problem. But if you pull out the balloon, you will have a bleed and in that panic you may not take the balloon the wire may come out and you have a bigger disaster when you take a stent take the cat5 to the point of stenosis take the stent across if it is difficult to take the stent across then take the neuromax cat5 and stent as one unit that means you move the whole thing as one unit and you'll very often see it move or if you're in a desperate situation, inflate the balloon and as the balloon is deflated, push the cat5 across and it will sometimes cross the stenosis. This is not a good maneuver. It's pretty bad because you actually can throw distal emboli. But if you're in a situation where you have to do it, this is the only way out. And remember, the stent and the balloon are the same size. Don't upsize the stent out here. Never use it across perforators. Dilate slow. Go really slow. And when you're suboptimal, that means if you need 9 atmospheres at 10, for uh, which is the nominal pressure, then at 5 atmospheres, deflate, take an injection, see if everything is proper, then go ahead and touch the nominal pressure very, very slowly. After that, deflate. And uh, after you're sure there is no bleed, remove the balloon. And when you remove the balloon, remember the CAT5 will tend to move forward. That's normal. 
So remember, it can cause a mess. Sometimes it can go the hit the edge of a stent, especially a coronary stent, and then you will have some bending of the struts. So pull the cat five down by at least four to five centimeters before you pull the balloon out, or you pull them both as one unit. Steps in a nitinol stent. The wire should be an exchange length if you're using a coronary balloon. Remember that. After dilatation, remove the balloon. Take a microcatheter, anything like SL10 across to a point about 3 centimeters beyond the stenosis. Take an appropriate credo with a radiopaque band across the stenosis. And for wingspan, take the device across the lesion. And if you're using Eurospeed, then you don't really need to have an exchange wire and you can slowly unsheath and deploy. Now, when you are in the vertebro basilar segment, you will have to use a 7 French sheet, keep into the subclavian artery, and from there you take a cat 5 and you go across. Now, remember one thing that you will never take the 7 French sheet into the vertebral artery. It be disastrous. You may lose the vessel. Sometimes you are working with only one vessel and you can have a death on the table. What are the medications we use? We load the patient with 180 milligrams of aspirin and uh, 180 milligrams of Brillianta plus aspirin 300 milligrams because we know that Brillianta does not have any resistance. Then we continue them on 90 milligrams of Brillianta BD and aspirin 70 mil, uh, milligrams OD. I'm sorry, it's not BD. And then in stroke, uh, suppose you're working with an acute stroke, then we would actually be using uh, 300 milligrams of aspirin on the table. We also give tyrofuse for three hours. And then after we have done an MR and seen everything is safe, you can start them on low molecular weight heparin. And after 12 hours, you repeat the uh, CT on MR. And if there is no bleed, we add a second antiplatelet agent. So you understand it's a dangerous situation when you're doing an angioplasty and stenting in a patient with a stroke where you're using dangerous drug which can induce bleeding. Let me show you some cases. Some cases where we use the credo. 60-year-old male, sudden onset slurring of speech, right upper uh, limb numbness, probably ha previously had a CA breast, diabetic ulcerative colitis with hypothyroidism. Hypothyroidism. Look at the MR. It shows some sparks. We do a CT, uh, MR, um, an MRA. You see a very, very critical stenosis that is there in the ICA on the side. The perfusion is lower on that side. This is technically easy to cross because it is very, very proximal. So we cross the lesion with a wire and use a coronary balloon. We used a coronary wire here. It's pretty proximal out here. We dilate it with a 2.5 into 15. There is a residual stenosis. Now look here. There is a massive mismatch between the vessel proximal to the stenosis and distal to the stenosis. So in such a situation, it's very important that we understand we cannot use a coronary stent because they can be thrombosis. So we here we use a credo which is 4.5 into 20 and you can see the result is really good. Another patient, 62 year old, slurring of speech, trans and left hemiparesis, diabetic, MRI done in April followed by DSA, she shows watershed infarcts. Have a look at this. You can see the watershed between the MCA and the ICA on the right side. We have a look at this. Look at this. The ICA is really stenosed and you can see the hyperperfusion on this side. This is a real dirty vessel. One wouldn't want to treat it because it's really bad. You do not know where you could end up with no collateral circulation from the opposite side. Patient was in bed, mess medical management but was not responding. We get a larger infarct there. We take the patient for treatment. We do a balloon angioplasty with a CAT5. We have a 300 mm wire across. You can see that here. Balloon dilatation with a 2 mm. After that, we put a credo stent across it, 3 into 20, and you can see a pretty decent result. And the patient was totally asymptomatic. The third case 63 year old male, slurring of speech, left handed numbness. What do you find here? There is some ischemic changes seen. In the parieto in the more in, in the parieto occipital region, you do an angio and you can see a distal stenosis in the MCA. Patient started on best medical management. One month later, again repeat of episode. You can see a larger infarct and a fresh infarct here. Here is the angio, a very critical stenosis in the distal MCA. 
Now in this case, you have to stent from one of the MCA branches. So the proximal vessel diameter is what's important. Dilatation, I know it's suboptimal, but that's the way we should do. And a credo, which is three millimeter, matching to the size of the M1 segment. Case four, 60 year old lady, a uh, male patient, sorry, hypertensive, has upper and lower lobe weakness 45 days back, associated with Caesar. We are giving him two antiplatelets, repeat episode again. MRI shows again infarcts. Here it is. Here's the watershed infarcts in the MI. This is what we saw. Tell is hypoperfusion out here. Very, very critical stenosis. Look at this. Very bad stenosis out here. Again, the same combination CAT5. Uh, 14 wire, which is uh, exchange length at 1.5 into 10 mm balloon, small vessel out there, a credo 3 into 20, and you get a pretty decent result again. Case 5, 64 year old female, recurrent TAA, history of giddiness, left sided aphasia, and what do we find? Multiple infarcts out here. Have a look at this. The MCA is occluded. This is an acute stroke. But we see extensive leptomeningeal collaterals, which suggests there is an underlying stenosis. So when we find history of recurrent PIA, extensive leptomeningeal collateral, atherosclerotic changes in the intracranial artery, think of an underlying stenosis. So here it is. We have done everything that is typically required for a Sulumbra technique. We go ahead. We use the infinity because the neuromax was straightening the vessel and obstructing flow. This is the modified Sulumbra technique. You can see the CAT6 here, the solitaire here. We use this as a unit. We suck it. We, there is underlying stenosis, residual thrombus. In no time it occludes the end. So we give tyrofiban as a bolus and an infusion. And then we find again the residual stenosis opens up. So what do we do? A balloon dilatation. Balloon dilatation again closes. Now we put a credo stent across it and you find a good result. But the thing in this, like I said, this is a bailout option. We do it in the end. You have to give the patient a try to fuse and we are always worried about bleed. The immediate MRI, no bleed. 12 hours, no bleed. Now we are happy. We start on dual antiplatelets and the patient did well. Case five, 72 year old male patient, diabetic hypertensive, presence with giddiness, scattered posterior circulation infarcts. You can see it here. And what do we have in the angio? A very tight stenosis of the basilar artery proximal to the ICA. Diffuse changes also seen in the anterior circulation. Here it is. It's a stenosis out here. We do, uh, oh, it was, we treated the patient with medical management, came back eight months later, again with fresh changes. Here is the lesion near occlusion. Here we change the the treatment strategy or the hardware strategy, the seven French long sheet in the subclavian, CAT5 in the vertebral artery, an SL10, a Traxx EX wire is used to cross the lesion. We pre dilate with the 2.75 coronary balloon and then place a onyx resolute and we open it. That's why I said in the posterior cranial fossa, we tend to use coronary stents. We have been happy with what we see over here. We have done several of these. Post stenting, good result patient has symptomatic improvement. Here's other patient, diabetic hypertensive, very similar features, non-visualization of the base artery, and uh, there is no booming on SWI. This is an acute stroke, anterior circulation. You can see the PCS filling, one side vertebral is close to non-existent. The off-side vertebral is the only vertebral that's available. We come across, there is this uh, lesion that we can see a very very tight uh, stenosis out here with like practically no flow across it. We dilated the balloon a little later we find that it is uh, kind of a shutting down. We start the patient on Trisprin and Clopidogrel. This is some time back. Today we use Tyrofuse and then after that we put a coronary stent and we get a great result at the end of it. And uh, of course the post MR showing good result. Case 7, another patient again with posterior cerebellar infarcts. Here is the uh, angio. We find a V4 high grade stenosis and the V4 terminates as the pica on the opposite side. 
there is a moderate stenosis in the proximal V1 segment and I'll show it in detail in the angio. So what's happening here on the left side, it, it stops short at the pica. On the right side, there is a stenosis in the proximal vertebral artery. Following that, there is a stenosis proximal to the pica and you can see this is the dominant artery, needs treatment. So what is the hardware? Five French catheter here, the cat five is taken across. We have to be a lot more careful with the stenosis, balloon dilatation, and after that, a stenting which shows a good result with coronary stent and shows good opposition on the Dyna CT. This patient did well but came back again with features of numbness on the finger. We repeat a CT angio and we can see that the stenosis in the proximal IC has progressed. We treat that also by placing a coronary stent across. Here is the balloon. This is the stent and end. We get a fabulous result at the end of it. Case 8. Here is another patient comes to us, giddiness, vomiting, six hours back, now with altered sensorium. It is an acute stroke. The brainstem is already showing ischemic changes. The post basilar is not seen at all. Angiogram shows a total occlusion at just above the distal to the ICA. To a suction, vessel opens up but starts shutting down in no time. Again, a modified solembra, vessel opens up starts shutting down again five minutes later. We run tidal fuse for some time and the vessel stays open. Now it's important to understand at this point you will not treat. The reason we are trying to emphasize is complication rates are much higher if you do a dilatation or if you go ahead and put a stent. Remember in this case the perforators are more here. We are just distal to the ICA and snow plowing can also occlude the ICA. So the best thing is if you can get away without anything just bail out and this is what happened the patient did well and could actually we could get away without doing any treatment case 9 is another patient again known diabetic history of tia and uh, has come to us now have a look at this you cannot see the m1 out here again a case of acute stroke but the mr shows some old infarct which is a very very important thing because it makes us understand maybe we are dealing an ICAD. It's occluded. We actually go ahead. We open the vessel. There is still a restrial stenosis. Tyrofuse is given. Still a restrial stenosis. Now we do a plain balloon angioplasty and the vessel stays open. So what I'm trying to share with you is stop at the least that you can do. Currently we don't need a stent. We are happy with that because the chances of patient recovering dual anti is much lesser. We can keep the patient on a single antiplatelet, including the safety. See the follow-up. Patient continues to do well. The patient actually improved completely over a period of time. In conclusion, what do you want to say? We say we what we want to convey is recent imaging is going to give us a lot more information. We're going to see the perforators better. We're going to see the lesion better. We can know the etiology better because of high division MRs and OCT coming. Angioplasty and scenting has a definite role with the management of ICAD when medical management fails. Complications are extremely low in experienced hand after three weeks of the events. Balloons should be undersized when you treat them. Exchange techniques carry a higher risk of perforation and is better to avoid them like using a neurospeed balloon and the credo stent. So, uh, thank you very much. I hope that this was helpful to you.